Hi, I'm Nick, and I'll be your quite unusual tour guide for today. And we start our global journey in London. Once upon a time, two people from a village in India, they walked into this building, St. Paul's Cathedral, and they admired the very nice stonework out there. On the same day, they informed the unknowing London city bankers walking to their desk, opening their financial newspaper through an advertisement, what they were up to. It was something going on that day in London. What was going on was there was an annual shareholder meeting of a mining company. And that mining company had a $7 billion plan to ruin this place, the Niamgiri Hills, located in the heart of India, where the two people from India were from. And for these two people, this is their cathedral. This is where, for them, the nature gods live. It's their cultural heritage. But it's also their source for water, food, medicine, and fuel. And without a good resistance, they would soon find themselves in the slums of some Indian megacity. However, their stunt in London actually worked. There was a media fuss around it, some scandal, and a major invested, this investor decided that they withdraw their investment in this mining company. Let's just say that the Church of England was not amused with the negative publicity for financing much less than holy behavior. Now, let me ask you a question. Does this make you think of a specific Hollywood blockbuster movie? Anyone? Try. Avatar. Avatar, thank you. Okay, hands up if you have seen the movie Avatar. So a lot of you have seen it. Well, if some of you haven't seen it, I mean, I think you should. It's a feast for the eye. Long story short, company goes to a faraway planet, tries to grab the resources, finds local people living in harmony who happen to be in the way, tries to push them aside. However, these local people find a way to unite, put up a resistance, and win. And by the way, in the Indian story, they also won. The whole project collapsed after the scandal erupted. And this is just one story, but it's not just a Hollywood story. It's not just resembling a real-life story. There are these avatar-like stories in the real world out there, many of them, thousands of them. And how do I know? Well, in the last 19 years, it's been my job to go there, to study them, to visit these places, and to ask the people what's happening and to seek for the causes, the deeper root causes of why do all these conflicts actually exist. What you see here is the Great Acceleration. It is a set of indicators of humanity in the last 250 years. You see things like the size of the world economy, greenhouse gas emissions, and the black line at the end is international travel. And there is a pattern in this installation at the beginning of an exposition about the topic. And the pattern is the first 150 to 200 years, all these lines, they rise gradually until some point they start rising exponentially. And we all know now, like, exponentially rising curves are a problem, right? The scientists behind this study, who call it the Great Acceleration, they also say, look, these are the curves that we need to flatten. This is the comet that's going to hit us. And that was before that other Hollywood movie was there. <laughs> Don't look up. And the scientists who did this, they got some traction with their article. I mean, they were invited in Davos to explain this to world leaders seven times. So despite that, somehow we are not yet flattening these curves. And the question then is why? Because it's because of all this eternal growth on a finite planet that we keep seeing all more front lines popping up all over the world. Now, to understand why, one part of the answer is you need to imagine a medieval city right now. Just give it a try in your mind. Let me maybe help you a bit. 
So the world tour continues from London, India, Paris. Now we're in Carcassonne, but I'm not a city guide. It doesn't really matter that this is Carcassonne. What matters is you're looking at this typical medieval city with these walls, right? Now imagine war breaks out in medieval times. Where do you want to be? The inside or the outside of these walls? Most people on the inside, I guess. And actually today, we live also in a kind of information wars where there is ever more information coming at us, there is more fake news coming at us, there is more bad news coming at us. And we all have these walls up here around our brains to filter that out. And let me just put a little wall here, because I might need to come back to it. We have these walls. And we also have these gatekeepers of the walls. These are the people who are telling us, like, it's going to be fine, you know, a little bit warmer, just stay in your mental comfort zone. A, a warmer climate is not that bad, you know. But then there are other gatekeepers say, yeah, okay, it's a problem, but you know what? Technology is going to save us all, you know, don't worry. Stay in your mental comfort zone. And we all have that. I have that too, right? Uh, and that's, that's normal. That's actually a protection mechanism. I mean, we need to stay sane. <laughs> Our mental well-being is important. But we also miss a lot of what's going on, go, going on outside these walls. So today I'm going to just briefly take you away over these walls, beyond these gate, gatekeepers, and we're going to let the nights of inconvenient truth, to name another film, and eco-anxiety storm through the gate, and we go outside and we look what's there. And I promise you, there's also beauty there. It's not all mad and bad. Okay, let's bring the bad news first, right? There is a small group of people out there who are making mountains of money, mountains, really, uh, with activities, economic activities, that are harming an ever larger majority, us. And just to give you one number from the bingo box of numbers, just this year, EU energy companies are forecasted to win another 200 billion euro in profits on top of their normal profits. This is the extra profits because of the war in Ukraine without doing anything special. And these are the same people who are actually in the 90s warning us for the effects of climate change. Guess who made the first documentary about climate change? It was the oil company, Shell, back in the 90s. They made this documentary like, well, maybe if you continue another 50 years burning fossil fuels, you know, we might get a problem with the climate. And then, Magically, they started investing in renewable energies. And then they just, nah, <laughs> not profitable enough. We, st we stopped doing that. But nah, it's not good enough anymore. And that's also why last year Shell lost in a major court case in the Netherlands. And the judge ordered this company to reduce their emissions in line with what the Paris Agreement says. That's really groundbreaking. Yeah. Woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's also true that with every oil company and mining company still active, ever more people are standing up to resist what they are doing. There is a global movement of resistance that's out there. And these people, they are like the bodyguards for all of us, the unknown soldiers of today. And yet, most of us have little idea who they actually are. And as it's been my job to go and visit and talk with them and write about them, I, I, I just thought I'd bring a couple of them in the meeting here with you. So let me introduce you to a couple of frontline heroes that I spoke with. This is Somaira. Somaira is a very brave woman from India because she is putting up a fight against India's sand mafia. And this is a huge mafia all over the place. She was beaten by this mafia. Her finger was broken, she was hospitalized. She was up against the minister for the environment who also was the boss of the biggest building company in that state and who was in cahoots with the police. In India since 2020, 400 people have died trying to resist the sand mafia from activists to journalists. And yet she continued her struggle, she went through the courts and she got some court victories. After which she also continued her struggle with journalists. She visited a place where the mafia was still extracting and they saw that she was filming and so a violent car chase erupted in the mountains in India. 
and there was a truck ready to push her car in the valley. And she told me that the only reason I'm still alive is that I happen to be a husband who's a rally driver. And <laughs> he learned me some of his driving skills, so I got away. Uh, but that's just the level of courage that these people have. That's amazing. I was very inspired by her story. And then this is Alexandru. Alexandru, he had a little antique shop uh, somewhere in Romania. But he saw on the news how another company was mining his place for gas, to get more gas out of the ground, with all kind of damage to the environment and the local people there. People were resisting, but they were repressed hardly. And he was so angry, he decided to leave his shop and walk 4,000 kilometers all the way to Brussels, on the way losing a toenail. But he arrived in Brussels, I, I met him there, he made it to the parliament, he made it into the media to tell his story about what's happening in Romania, because otherwise in the Brussels bubble we didn't know about this. And he succeeded as well. This mining, this gas project was also cancelled. Here is Roger Cox, is the lawyer who did the court case against Shell last year, but he also did other court cases against the Dutch state for violating their duty of care. And he won that. He's doing the same in Belgium. And now there are 2,000 climate court cases all over the world. It's revolution through justice that he is leading. It's a very inspiring guy. But this guy is also inspiring me, Julio, Julio Prieto from Ecuador. He is defending 30,000 people in Ecuador who are the victims of the legacy of oil pollution from a massive US oil company that just left a mess in the Ecuadorian rainforest and refuses to clean up, despite a court saying that they have to. This is one of these metaphorical bodyguards that actually soon needed a real bodyguard to protect him after he started with the court case. And these are just a few of the more like, known heroes in these countries at least, but there are thousands and millions of anonymous activists out there who are on these front lines trying to do what they can. I met a couple of them and I was so inspired by them. Together, they form what Naomi Klein once called the imaginary country of Blockadia. Blockadia where people are blocking the extraction industries. And I'm hoping that after this talk, some of you will maybe also join this uh, movement. Um, to wrap up, these people, they are proving every day that we are so much more than homo economicus, like the neoliberal spin doctors want you to believe we are. We are just calculating things, you know? No, we are human beings, we care, we are social, we work together. We are actually, as historian Rutger Bregman called it, most people are good people. Sometimes that's hard to see when you watch the news, but most people are good people. And some of these good people have the courage to be on these front lines, and the other good people, a lot of them are I here in the room, I think, we are invited to support them because they need our support. They do the risky things out there. I think it's fair to say that we live um, in an era of crisis, but every crisis is an opportunity. So now that I have said that, we actually live in an era of opportunities. And the scientists that I work with say that this global movement for environmental justice it has never been as big as now. And this whole era, I think it will be defined by two questions. Hey, Dad, did you colonize my future? If not, which part of the resistance movement were you? And the worst job interview you ever did is going to be a walk in the park. <laughs> if you come totally unprepared to this chat with your children, I have two children, so I need to be prepared for this chat. And I've been thinking about that. I think we can all be honest about our climate sins and procrastination and doubts and anger and frustration. I think my generation, I'm 41, and, and, and older generations, we all had to take this long, bumpy road from blissful ignorance to, hmm, maybe something is wrong here, to changing our lifestyles bit by bit, maybe then starting with some clicks for a petition, maybe joining Friday for Future on the streets, and yeah, sure. <laughs> And then, and then gravitating more and more towards either supporting these people on the front lines or just being there. Um, and you don't have to be 
the, with the first group that breaks through a police cordon to occupy a coal mine. These people actually need a field kitchen, an art team, and a back office too. So <laughs> you can do any kind of support you want. It all depends. Like You need to find something that fits with your personality, something that fits with your position in life. And here is then my promise to you. Once you find this local franchise of this global environmental justice movement that fits with you, it feels so much better to be alive today, really. And whether that's, whether that's with Extinction Rebellion in the streets, or if you're more comfortable with being in a community farm with 500 people and three farmers working together on building up the alternative, you can choose anything you want to do. But it's important that to realize that we are in this struggle for materials, there is a lot of money involved, and we all have these mental walls around us, and we need to find the courage to go over it, make our hands a little dirty, or reach out the hand to the people who are doing the dirty work for us. And then you will feel honored to be just a tiny part of it all. It will feel so much better to be alive, because your feeling of helplessness and frustration, it will evaporate as you are immersed in a world full of support, care, solidarity, standing up for justice. And in the end, you will know how to answer these questions that are going to come for you, either from your kids or your inner devils. Thank you and see you at the front line. <laughs>